Hi, I'm Preston Williams, and welcome to another edition of Jazz Talk. Today on our show, we have with us one of the most accomplished musicians around. This gentleman has been on the scene for over 40 years and has worked with many greats from Sting to Carly Simon, David Bowie, Weather Report, Marcus Miller, and yes, even Miles Davis. He is a drummer, composer, and educator. Please welcome to Jazz Talk, the legendary Mr. Omar Hakim. Welcome, sir. Hello there. <laughs> Man, it is so, so good to, uh, as I said, have you on the show. Now, uh, Omar, you've been on the scene, man, for quite a while. Uh, you've played with so many different people. I mean, your resume is unbelievable of the different artists that you've worked with. And I understand that you're from uh, Jamaica, Queens, New York. Yes, I am. Born and, and raised in Jamaica, Queens. Okay, okay. You started uh, playing drums at a very early age, at age five. Tell us about your background, man, coming up and how you got involved in music. Well, actually, um, music uh, was the family business in a way. Uh, yeah. My dad was a professional musician, a trombonist. Yeah. Uh, who played with uh, luminaries like uh, Count Basie and Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong. In fact, he told me that uh, he left his hometown of Birmingham, Alabama at age 16 right. with the Louis Armstrong big band. Oh, wow. Uh, evidently what happened that uh, he was at the show and uh, the trombonist got sick, something happened and uh, he jumped in and read the charts down and, and Louie hired him. Incredible. Wow. Yeah. And uh, that, that got him out of Birmingham, Alabama at a very, very young age. Yeah. Um, so I grew up around music. Uh, I got interested in music very, very young because my uncle, uh, his brother, uh, also had instruments all over the house. And when we would visit them, they had a piano and a guitar and a, a Hammond organ. And, right. it, you know, there's this music everywhere. Uh, my Aunt Maggie uh, played piano and sang. And I remember sitting around the piano with her singing, singing songs as a kid. And then she taught me how to play them on the piano. So I got, I was immersed, I guess you can say, in, in, in the musical vibe. And then when Holiday... Um, one of my other uncles gave me a little toy snare drum and um, they put the thing around my neck and I just started playing. I started playing one of those marching cadences that I heard on, on TV somewhere, you know, they were like, whoa, <laughs> how, how, how is he doing that? You know? Right. Right. And, and I, and I get, you know, of course I don't remember this is them telling me what happened, but um, I think that's, I realized that I was very comfortable uh, with drums and yeah, and, felt very natural for me to 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 play drums and, and deal with rhythm. But at the same time, I was, like I said, exposed to guitar, piano. Um, and so I think it was just like a, a steady, balanced diet of a little bit of everything, if you will. Yeah, yeah. You know? Interesting. And, uh, yeah, and then I started, I started playing with my dad uh, around 10 years old did my did my first gigs with him mm. uh, he's like all right you you you're 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 in the band now you know? that's incredible omar i wanted to ask you now i understand that your father was uh friends with john coltrane and maybe through that association you got a chance to spend time and hang with people like art blakey and elvin jones that is correct uh um train lived in our neighborhood in jamaica queens wow. i want to say he lived on mexico street um I, I can I could if I could drive you there right now, I know exactly where the house is. Wow. Uh, and I remember going to his house as a little boy because um uh they would hang, man, my mom and dad and train and Naima. He was still with Naima at that That's time. right. Yeah. Um and I my recollection of going to the house was that he always came to the door with a horn around his neck. I, I remember that. And my mom, my mom said that every time I'd see him, I call him Big John. There was a, some kind of TV commercial on right. Big Big John. I'd sing this whole thing to him that cr would crack him up. Big John, Big Big John, and he had the the horn. And I remember walking into the house. It's funny how kids are impressionable, right? And I re I remember all of his saxophones lined up in the living room under this window. And, and, and I kind of remember them all being lined up in size order. Wow. There was a, there was a 
a curved soprano, a straight soprano, an alto. You know, he the, t the tenor stand would be empty because he'd have it around his his neck, and maybe there was a, a barry there, and and the next to that was a telescope. Wow. And uh, so that that's some of my memory of of going to his house, and my parents would hang out, and and sometimes his daughter would babysit me, and they would go to dinner or whatever. And uh, yeah, so it's it's pretty heavy. But I also remember going to Art Blakey's house with my dad in Harlem. Uh, I remember going to this this club in our neighborhood called the Club Ruby. Yeah, they had a, 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 a jazz Sunday brunch. So you know, of course, the parents could bring their kids to that. And I remember seeing like Horace Silver and oh, man. Roland Kirk and. <sighs> You know, the first time I saw the three horns in somebody's mouth, man, that <laughs> that, that blew my mind. I was like, yeah, he's yeah, playing he, three horns at the same time. <laughs> I know. He was, he was incredible, man. Yeah. yeah. It was pretty wild, man. So uh, Elvin, of course. Um, McCoy Tyner. Phew. McCoy. Um, yeah, the neighborhood was incredible, man. I mean, James Brown had a house in St. Albans, Queens. Which wow. Is you know, so the, Count Basie also lived in the area. There were a lot of, you know, the music was in the air, the culture, art. That was Jamaica Queens, man. Yeah. Uh, and and not just jazz, R and B, hip hop. I mean, it is it is it is really a, a creative center, Jamaica yeah. Queens. I mean, there's. It's mind blowing. Weldon Irvine. I don't know if a lot of people know Weldon. Oh, I know who that is. Yeah, but Weldon was was a real mentor to a lot of the kids my age, and mm -hmm. and myself, Marcus Miller, Don Blackman, keyboardist Be uh, Bernard Wright, Tom Brown. We all played in Weldon Irvine's band as kids, and uh, Weldon had a <laughs> he had a he had a band with two of everything: two drummers, two guitar players. I called it Weldon's Ark. Cause he had like <laughs> two of everything, <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> and it was really fun, man. You yeah, know? wow. Omar, I was going to ask you during that time period. You know, of course, you're honing your skills. You're growing up as a teenager. Were you playing in local bands uh, in the area? Because, like I said, so much talent. And I know that you and Marcus Miller have an association. You guys go way back. But oh, yeah. were you playing in uh, local bands during that time in the area? Absolutely. Absolutely, and the, and and the, it was rich with the local bands. I mean, on one hand, I'm playing with my dad. We're playing jazz, you know, the jazz standards. But then on the on the other hand, I'm playing with the kids my age, and we're playing funk and R and B and rock music. And I was in a band called Chari it, Well, the, the band was called Charisma when I joined. Yeah. And then um, they changed the name of the band to Jack Sass. Jack Sass. Okay. Okay. Right. So, you know, if you, when you say that fast, it's pretty hilarious when people, <laughs> when people announce the band, which, you know, some straight up silly teenager stuff. But that was the name of our band. We were sort of like the only black rock funk band yeah. in Queens at the time, sort of like like a local mother's finest, if you will. A, yeah. lot, a lot of the other bands were primarily playing funk and soul. And I played with a lot of those bands, too. Right. But but Sass was straight up funk rock. And the first time I met Marcus Miller, and you, you talk about local bands and stuff, uh, there, you know, there was a lot of battle of the bands around the neighborhood. And so Sass rolled up on a on a on a battle of the bands at the Rochdale Village Center. And um before we went on, there was a there was an R and B band with, with five singers out front. Yeah. And you know the five singers, of course, five guys with some serious dance steps, and you know they were doing like Delphonics, Jackson Five, Stylistics, you know, kind of in that mode. And I noticed that the little lead singer, when they would break into the Jackson Five stuff, this dude could really dance. I was like, that is crazy, and he was clearly my age. You know, and, and sass to some of the cats were a little bit older than me, not much, but a little bit older. But I was like, I got to talk to that that lead singer dancer dude because he's like crazy so i went up to him and i was like man what's your name oh my name is marcus <laughs> marcus miller <laughs> was the lead singer wow of this band and not he was, too many people know this man wow dude, marcus could dance i mean it I, he blew my mind 
and we became friends. And he was like, well, I play bass. And I was like, really? And and we, ho we hooked up, you know, days later. And I went by his place. And I was like, wow, this guy can really play the bass. He, he could play clarinet, too. Yeah. Right? So we were 14, I guess. Wow. Right? So funny thing is, the next time I saw, like, we, you know, I went on the road. I did my first tour around 15 years old. I had just graduated junior high school. Wow. Uh, the artist's name was Jay Mason. Yeah. Um, and it was a keyboard player named Denzel Miller, really an amazing keyboard player, uh, who uh, came by and got my parents' permission to, to take me on tour. Right. And, um, but right before the tour, I had auditioned to get into music and art high school in New York City. And I found out that I was accepted. So the next time I saw Marcus Miller was September at music and art high school. I didn't know he was, he was, he had enrolled too. Wow. And it seemed like in high school, we were really always hanging because it was a long bus and train ride from Queens all the way to Harlem. Yeah. On the uh, city college campus. So, you know, so you're right. Marcus and I go back. Incredible, man. I've seen him in so many interviews, man. Talk about you, and and even Lenny Lenny White was telling me he says, "Man, I watched these two grow up." And he said the talent that both of them had. He says, "I knew that they were both going to be, you know, something special." Now, didn't you and Marcus form, or you guys were in that band? I guess around eighty, early eighties, like uh, Steps Ahead. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, actually, you know, Marcus Marcus Marcus's career in the studio session scene started for him pretty young as well. And he met um, a couple of producers that basically took him under their wing and just started hiring him for, for everything. Yeah. You know, and he also played with Lenny uh, very young. I think he did the right. White's Astral Pirates session. Marcus must have been like 17 or 18 years old when they did that record. Yeah. Yeah, he was on a, a Lenny White album, I believe, called Venusian, not Venusian Summer, but Big City. That yeah, was yeah, like yeah. Back in '77, that was the first time I saw him, and Verdine White of Earth, Wind, and Fire was on there too. I'm like, wow. So, yeah. Yeah, but Marcus, Marcus um, met um, the vibraphonist and producer Mike Manieri. Yes. And um, and they had just finished doing a record uh, for a Japanese guitarist called. Katsumi Watanabe, really amazing. Yeah, I know that. And uh, they were the, the album was called Tochika. Now they were about to go on the road, and the drummers on the record were um, Steve Jordan on half the record and Peter Erskine on the other half of the record. Yeah. And um, but Peter was booked to go on the road with with Weather Report. This is 1980, and um, uh, Steve Jordan had a uh, had a tour with the 24th Street Band with Will Lee and Hiram Bullock. Right, oh yeah, the late Hiram Bullock, yeah. Yeah, man, they, that, that band was incredible. I used to go see them live in the city all the time too. So they needed a drummer for the Katsumi Watanabe tour and Marcus hooked me up because Marcus is the one that introduced me to Mike Manieri. Yeah. And Mike is like, well, who is this guy, Omar? And, and Marcus is just hire him. You won't <laughs> just call him. You, you, you're going to be happy. Just call him. I mean, Marcus really, right. really put me down for that, you know? And, uh, and that was my first trip to Japan. Incredible. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was really a gas to, to be hanging with my, my buddy in, in Tokyo, walking around, checking everything out. And yeah, man, man, that's yeah. incredible. And not long after that, Omar, you, uh, I guess you toured her, went out with uh, Carly Simon. What was that I did. like? And th well, that was the, that, believe it or not, that's the Mike Maneri connect again. Cause gotcha. Mike went, right after we got back from Japan, um, Mike Maneri uh, told me that he had just finished producing a record for Carly Simon called Come Upstairs. Yeah. And they were planning a tour. And I think typically he would have like somebody like Russ Kunkel playing drums, who was part of, um, James Taylor's band, you know, they had that that community of musicians. But uh, Mike Maneri said to me, well, can you play rock music? And I was like, yeah, I can play rock. And he said, and he said, I heard you sing. He said, can you sing and play at the same time? And I said, yes, I can. He said, fine, I'm going to hire you to play drums and sing back up on this Carly Simon tour we have coming up this summer. So I get done with with 
Japan and we go into rehearsals with Carly, summer of 1980. I'm on the road with Carly Simon. Wow. With um, Warren Bernhardt on, on keyboards. Yeah. And uh, Mark Egan on bass. Oh, great bassist, yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, Sid McGinnis on guitar. Uh, Mike on on vibes, of course. Myself. It was so much fun, man. Yeah. The, the tour was too short, unfortunately, because Carly was very nervous about performing live. But when they got her on the stage, man, she was just amazing. You know. But That's but that, but Lenny White, man, was my <laughs> hero. Yeah. Yeah. Lenny White was 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 my hero, man. And I got to tell you a story. You talk about that neighborhood. Yeah. I, I, I told you I used to go visit my aunt and uncle who had like the house full of instruments. Right. And I would hang with them every weekend. And there was another local band in the area called Five Carat Soul. Five Carat right? Soul. OK. Yeah. They were they, another awesome, incredible band uh, led by a uh, couple of old friends, Barry Johnson, who also used to play with Lenny White's 29 band. In okay. fact, Barry Johnson was the lead singer uh in on in in lenny white's band remember he had a band called 29 i do peanut butter peanut butter yeah. exactly don blackman well barry johnson was the bass player and singer in that band yeah but I, again i'm going back to early 70s now right and five carat soul used to re rehearse around the corner from my aunt so i used to go over there and hang out and listen to barry and steve horton and his brother larry horton the drummer yeah and, you know and and they were wild because they could play some r b like crazy but Every now and then they break into a song by the Mahavishnu Orchestra, oh, <laughs> and I was like, "How are they doing this?" <laughs> it was really, it was really amazing. But on my way on that walk to Larry and Steve Horton's house, there was a drummer practicing in the basement who was throwing down. Man, I was like, "Dag, who is that?" So I asked Barry John, Barry's son John Johnson, I said, "Who's that drummer?" And he said, "Oh, that's a guy named Lenny White." He plays for a band called Azteca. And I was like, I know that band, Azteca. I thought they were a West Coast band. No, Lenny White's right here from, from Queens. So I remember hearing Lenny yeah. in practice wow. in the house. Right? And it that I was like, wow, man, our neighborhood is was off the hook, man, with with musicians. Now, right after that, uh talk again, the connections between everybody. Uh the, the SAS band. There were two guys that were into Scientology in our band, right? The bass player and I think the organ player. Uh, yeah. And so one day they came to the rehearsal and they were like, hey, you know, we were at a meeting today and we met uh, Stanley Clark and Chick Corea. And, I, and we told them about our band. And so they're going to come and hear us in Central Park next weekend. We used to play, we had a, a pass to play in Central Park like a permit every Sunday, yeah. summer of 73. Yeah. And so no matter what time our gig got done on a Saturday night, we would load our, our van and we would drive to Central Park and set up and play from like 12 to four in the afternoon. Okay. You got a lot of gigs like that and you gotta, you gotta apply and get a permit and they tell you where to plug in and where you set up. Right. We set up on the grass, all of our gear. And so when they're saying Stanley Clark and Chick Corea are coming to hear the band, I'm bugging out at the rehearsal <laughs> because I, you know, growing up in a jazz house, I'm like, do y'all understand who's right. <laughs> coming to hear us play? Right. So they came the, 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 the following Sunday, they came and they, they, I was like, wow, this is crazy. They love the band. They were like, man, you guys sound really good. And Chick was like, we want to come, we want to bring our band and come out and play with you guys next weekend. Wow. So I'm, I'm now I'm really, I'm 14 years old. I'm bugging out, right? Because I'm telling the guys in the band, do you understand that this is return to forever? Right. Right. <laughs> they're, they're going to come with return to forever next weekend. Yeah. So the next weekend they show up and it's the new return to forever. It's not the one with Joe Farrell and Aerto and Flora Pruitt. It's Lenny White. And Billy Connors on guitar. That's right. The first band that made uh, the hymn of the Seventh Galaxy record. That's right. And they, I think they just finished the record. And so they were playing that music. Man, I, I'm, I'm a 14 year old kid that lost their mind <laughs> in the park that day. That's incredible. It was, 
Yeah. And Lenny was playing, uh, did he play my drums? No, he brought his kit. He had a little clear fives kit. Something like that. Or or either that or a Gretsch kit. I might be mixing cats up now because also Billy Cobham was playing the fives kit as well. But um, it was, a, it was a, an experience. And so Chick invited us to be the opening act for them for a few gigs. Wow, that's incredible, man. So you, know, you, just, I, you just made me think about something um, that you brought up. You know, a lot of people don't know, and uh, Lenny told me this story too, a lot of people don't know how Return to Forever went electric. You know, Stanley and Chick went to see the Mahavishnu Orchestra and it blew their minds. And whoa. then from there, they turned electric. That's how that whole thing happened. Okay. They were influenced by them. But uh, that must have been incredible for you to be 14 years old mm. and to be going through that. Wow. You know? Oh, yeah. You got the same no, thing as me. You got, you got allergies, man. I'm, I'm have, I got allergies today, too, for some oh, reason. Oh, yeah. to bother me. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, me, I'll be. Oh no, no, no you're fine, brother. Movie. You're fine. But yeah, 14 years old to be opening for Return to Forever. That that's a game changer. Wow. Oh, it blew it blew my mind to 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 witness. You know, now what we know is history in the making with this band. Right. At the beginning of it, you know, from that that gig in Central Park, man, it was like, it was really mind blowing, and and that was that was an incredible time because of. Bands like the Mahavishnu Orchestra and Weather Report. That's right. That's and right. Return to Forever. You know what I mean? And yeah. um, I got a chance to see um, Mahavishnu Orchestra live. They played at, at the Queens College <sighs> Auditorium. And um, it was it was pretty incredible. So and and, and and you know, all of this music, funk and rock and jazz right. was converging in a really, really exciting way at this moment. You know, thanks to people like Miles Davis and- This brew and, and Tony Williams' Lifetime. Tony Williams' Lifetime, crazy. Yeah. You know, I mean, this this was a revolutionary time in music. Yeah. Where the, the tradition and the technology converged, the jazz language with, 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 the, with the, the music of the young people at the time, which was funk and rock. And to have those guys, you know, fuse that language together. Right. And create something that really connected with young people at the time. You know, I remember when Stanley Clark's School Days record came out. And here's here's a little trivia for you. The School Days album cover is done in a in a train station. You remember there's a, a, ah. there's a subway station. Okay, the yeah. Subway station. If you remember the album cover, it says 135th Street. Yeah, yeah. Now, everybody at Music and Art High School was bugging out because that was the train stop of Music and Art High School. Oh, so we I didn't know up that, and, man. We wow. up and down. Stanley Clark took the picture <laughs> at the subway station right down the hill. You know what wow. I mean? So that that really had a lot of... Say. I don't know where they did that picture. Maybe they did do it. In that station, but that was the train station for music in our high school, right? That's upstairs. incredible! Wow, Amor, I, I didn't know that. I think a lot of people don't know that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So Talk about some trivia. Oh yeah, that's that's trivia. I mean, I remember Earth, Wind, and Fire playing on the CCNY college campus back then. And, you know, all of these bands were new, and they were they were they were connecting with the community and 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 trying to make it. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it was exciting, man. That's incredible. You know, Omar, I was going to ask you, getting back to uh, Marcus, you know, steps ahead and working with Carly Simon, not long after that, in the early 80s, man, uh, I guess Peter Erskine and Jocko Pastorius left Weather Report. How did you get the gig, man, to work with Weather Report? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> working with working with Wayne Shorter and Joe Zawinu. Wow. You know? Well, I was, I was, again, playing a lot of local clubs and a lot of local venues in New York with different artists. Yeah. Uh, there were times when I'd be playing downtown at the Brecker Brothers Club. They had a club called 7th Avenue South. Yeah. Uh, then there was an uptown scene at a club called McKell's. Um, and McKell's was awesome because it was sort of like, a, uh, it was a jazz scene, but it was also a black cultural hang as well. So, you know, uh, there would be famous actors, actresses, models, writers, all yeah. converging on McKell's 
to hear jazz and funk and R&B and whoever was coming through. Yeah. Right? And I was playing there with Hugh Masekela. Uh, I played there, uh, uh, like, jam sessions. Donald Blackman and I would would play there a lot with different artists. Um, I remember one time Don, Don and I are jamming and Stevie Wonder walked in with Chaka Khan and that turned into a jam. But the reason I'm bringing Mikel's up is because one night I was playing and I looked down at the bar and I said to Don, isn't that Miles? And so Don looked and sure enough, Miles Davis is sitting at the bar. That's what kind of club this was. Ooh, wow. Right? Anybody could could show up. So uh I get a call um out of the blue. And um actually I wasn't home when the call came in. My mom said to me, oh, you got a call, I got a message here, a guy called you earlier. He had a really funny name. She said it started with a Z and he said something about a weather report. <laughs> that was, that I bet was, you were like, what? I put that together. I was like, starts with a Z, call from California, said something about a weather. I was like, where's that? Where's that message? Where? She's like, wait a minute, baby. I, I find it. It's around here somewhere. <laughs> I was like, no, you got to find that message right now. Where is that phone number? <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> And sure enough, I, I called the number back and Joe picked up. Um, the story is, is that Joe and Wayne called three people in New York to ask for a recommendation. Um, they called Michael Urbaniak, violinist. They called Gil Evans, who you know who Gil Evans is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, just, I did my first tour of Europe in 1981 with Gil. So... Wow. You know, I, Gil was very, you know, he, he, he loved me and he hooked me up and, you know, he gave me a lot of, of freedom to, to express myself in his band. Mm -hmm. And then the last person they called was Miles. Lucky for me, all three of those guys said to Joe and Wayne, there's a kid in New York you got to hear named Omar Hakeem. Miles said it. Gil said it. Gil said he toured with me. He's So, you know, I thank... Thank God that those guys. Well, you know, anything that Gil Evans says, Miles is going to probably agree with, because, you know, that that was his guy, you know, collaborators. But that's incredible, man, to have cats like that, you know, recommending you. Wow. I, it blew my mind um, because I'm I'm a young professional musician in New York just trying to make it, just yeah. trying to go around and have fun playing and contribute to any musical situation that I'm in. Um and so when that break happened, that was huge. But what's interesting about it though, is remember I started touring. Like I, I, at this point, when I think about it, I had been playing gigs since I was 10. Yeah. This was like 12 or 13 years later. You were ready, man. I was already ready. touring and yeah. making records with people, you know? So it, it, it was an interesting road up until that point. Yeah. And I felt ready. And I was a huge fan of Weather Report. So this was also a dream come true for me to, to get to play with my heroes. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. You had uh, bassist your uh, the late Victor Bailey, God rest his soul, man. He was uh, in there with you too, fantastic. But that period that you were with him for a few years was fantastic, man. It's like you just picked up where those other cats left off and you guys just kept the music going and everyone was like, man, who are these young musicians with the Rather Report? Oh, that's that's Omar Hakeem, man. And uh, it was fantastic. I loved it. What was it like playing with those guys? I mean, you know, like maybe the first rehearsal, were you nervous? Were you like, I'm ready because I know this music really well? What, what was your, uh, your feeling like during that time period when you first worked with them? Oh my God, man. I was, I was nervous. I was excited. And I was like, okay, I know Weather Report music, so I'm ready to do this. Yeah. Uh, but when I got there, um, slightly different experience because the plan wasn't to take the new band out playing a lot of the old music. Ah, okay. So Joe and Wayne were really all about 
uh, new band, new music. And so basically they were um, breaking out new charts on, on us. Here, here, check this one out. You know, <laughs> I was like, whoa. So what I thought we were going to do didn't happen at all. Right. right? And I've told this story in, in other places before. It, it's pretty funny because... I'm like, okay, so we got a week to prepare. We have a week rehearsal for our debut gig at a jazz, a jazz festival in San Diego. Right. And and then somebody in the management had mentioned it's going to be really exciting because Leonard Feather is going to be there. Oh wow! View the band. So see, you see the face that you made. <laughs> the people who know Leonard Feather know that Leonard Feather was tough. Yeah, he's a he's an interesting critic. I mean, this guy goes way back. I look at a lot of the stuff that he wrote, you know, from Downbeat and different articles. Oh yeah, Leonard Feather. Yeah, exactly. So everybody who read Downbeat magazine at that, you know, we all knew who Leonard Feather was, right? And right, like, right. Holy crap, man! <laughs> Leonard Feather front <laughs> row first gig, right? So I'm like, all right, we got to get ready, you know, and uh, and then Joe and Wayne they would like play a chart. And then we'd get halfway through it and they'd be like, yeah, let's take a break. So then, you know, I'd bring the chart with me to the break so I could look over it and, you know, they'd be serving tea and, you know, we'd be talking and then we'd go back. And I, I think we're going to go back and play that same chart again. And then Wayne would pull out something else. <laughs> oh, let's try this. So, okay. You know, let's we play that one and jam on it and vibe it and then... They'd be like, you know, it's time for lunch. So then we'd stop. It seemed like everything was happening fast. So we'll stop. We'll have lunch. And then we'd have like a two-hour lunch, right? Right. In the middle of this rehearsal, talking and hanging. And and it would have been okay, except this went on all week. And I was starting to get nervous because I was feeling like, well, we weren't really, it didn't feel like we were playing a lot of music, but we were hanging a lot and eating and you know, then we play a little bit and we play a half a chart that we put that away and then we play a snippet of something else. And, you know, and I was like, oh, man, <laughs> I saw those guys roll. Wow. Maybe that's part of the learning, you know? Yeah, exactly. And and, you know, I was like, all right, well. Here we go, you know, <laughs> and and the gig. When the gig finally came. It was a beautiful gig, actually, and. That was my lesson. It, it, my lesson was that even though you're learning the music, those breaks were just as important to the rehearsal as the playing was. Mm. Because what is music other than a conversation anyway? Well, That's powerful. So if we are playing a half a chart and breaking bread together, or if we play for a couple of hours and stop and look at a little bit of the football game. Right. Or if we play two tunes and maybe jam on the same, you know, and then we have dinner. And then you look at the rehearsal, you say, well, we, we spent five hours hanging and three hours playing. You know, that was rehearsal. Yeah. And every conversation that we had all week, we finished on stage in front of Leonard Feather. Incredible. So, you know, I was like, that is a great lesson for a young musician. Yeah. Because a great band not only plays well together, but they listen to each other. Exactly. And they leave space for the conversation. Yeah. And they, 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 they support the bandmate in those moments of expression. You know what I mean? So it was a beautiful lesson for me. Wow. Wow. Omar, what was your perception of Wayne Shorter? I mean, being the brilliant composer that he is, I mean, were you looking at this guy like, wow, man, I'm playing with Wayne Shorter, you know, because this cat had been with Miles, wrote most of that music. Of course, you know, you're with Weather Report and of course, Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. I mean, he's one of the, the most prolific composers uh, of all time in jazz. What was your perception of what he was writing, what he was doing? I mean, were you like, this is incredible when you were like, you know, playing those compositions. Like I said, growing up in a jazz house, I knew exactly what I was walking into and I knew who I was about to spend some time with. 
Yeah, yeah. I I knew. And I also understood that Wayne Shorter is not only one of the architects of, of, of modern bebop, but also one of the bridges into fusion as well. That's so, great. you know, they talk about Miles and they talk about, you know, Zawinul and John McLaughlin, but you can't leave Wayne Shorter out of that either That's because right. a lot of his compositions in Weather Report also defined the er, er, uh, the era. Yeah. Right? So Wayne Shorter is a, is a, is a fascinating and brilliant and deep human being. Yeah. A musician. And I spent a lot of time on the road with, with Wayne because Wayne and I would be the only two up first thing in the morning, you know? So Wayne would call me or I'd call him and we would, go out in the morning and have breakfast together and talk of, and and Wayne you know it's funny because we would be talking about books and movies and you know he would be telling me about the latest Dean Koontz book he just read Omar you got to check this out and you know we talk about sci-fi movies and yeah you know he wanted to talk about family and he wanted to you know you know how's your girlfriend doing you know <laughs> Wayne was always you know, connecting life to the to the music. And and the funny thing is the more time I spent with Wayne and then we would go to the gig that night, I realized that talking to Wayne and listening to him play is the same thing. Interesting. Wow. In other words, wow. I you know, Wayne, you know, and, and then I said, Well, wow, that's a that's a that's a pretty deep connection to your instrument that you're so connected to it that your personality comes through the instrument like that. And that I recognize the approach to the playing and how he spoke. Uh. You know what I mean? And and sometimes he would speak in really funny, like he's a really funny cat, man. He would speak in really funny abstract kind of things. And then other times he was very direct and there, there were nights when I watched Wayne develop a solo from four or five notes. Wow. You know, like Wayne, we all know Wayne's chops, but Wayne's musical mind is, is what, bl what blew me away. Yeah. And I watched him literally, and I think we were at the Palladium in New York City. And he threw one note, two notes, three, four notes, five different notes, right? And then I watched him rearrange those five notes. And then I watched him play them at different velocities and different dynamics. The whole solo was five. I, I was like, he messed me up that night <laughs> because he just kept right, making different right. shapes with these same five notes. Right, right. You know? Yeah. And I was like, wow, that that was deep. And funny, Herbie said something similar to me yeah. about choice of notes. He said, Omar, he said, all of my, he said, if you look at my hits, he said, the, my all of my hits are typically no more than four or five notes. Boop, bop, boop, bop, yeah. boop, bop, 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 boop, bop. Ba, 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 ba. Right? right. right. That's right. That? You know that song. Rocket, man. Rocket, exactly. Or he said, ba, 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 ba. Three notes, right? Ba, ba, ba. There's the fourth note. Ba, ba. Yeah. Ba, 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 fifth note. Ba, 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 da. Ba, ba, da, ba, 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 ba. I was like, wow, interesting. So when he started dropping the science on, yeah. On small amounts of notes that connect with the people's minds over the right groove and then the harmonic thing that happens underneath it. I, I you know, I learned a lot about composition from them. Yeah, that's you so know? powerful. You know, Herbie said the greatest song that he ever wrote was Maiden Voyage. 
And speaking of Wayne Shorter, I heard an interview with him in Zawanu one time, and they said, hey, we don't write songs. We write sagas and epics. Exactly. You know? Yeah, who said that? Wayne Shorter and Joe Zawanu. Yes, yes. And that is absolutely right, man. And I witnessed it, and I watched them and how they explore a melodic concept. Like on the first record that I did with Weather Report, I I submitted a song called Molasses Run. Mm-hmm. And I let Joe hear the demo and he really liked the demo. Uh, but he was like, we'll work on this tomorrow. He stayed, I guess that night he worked on it and he reharmonized it. He didn't change my melody at all. But when I came back the next day, what he had done underneath it blew my mind. And it was it was because of that experience that if I write something, I always put it away and then I come back and look at it again and explore uh, what, what else I can do with the harmony. Yeah. That yeah. sort of, you know, changes the shape, the mood, you know, the intention and all of this. So the, to, to be around those guys, uh, to observe them and witness their genius up close like that uh, was really an incredible experience for a young me. <laughs> it yeah, just, yeah. It just, it was mind blowing, man. That's incredible. And Almari, like I said, you played with them for a few years and after them, uh, I guess you hooked up with uh, David Bowie. What was it like working with him, man? Well, that was um, the connection for David Bowie came from another dear friend who I, who I'd known since I was very young. And that, that's the guitarist producer extraordinaire. Nile Rogers. Oh wow, no, yeah. Now Nile in, in the you talk about playing with local bands, and I had mentioned a name earlier in their interview, a guy named Denzel Miller. Denzel and I had a band that was playing at Great Adventure Amusement Park in New Jersey. Oh, I remember Great Adventure. Wow. Right? So you would walk, you know how you walk through an amusement park and you see band shells? Yeah, yeah. And there's bands playing. Uh huh. At all these different shells, and we were one of the we were the R and B cover band that summer at, <laughs> at 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 we and we had two girls, fronting the band. And the band was called Brown Sugar. Brown Sugar. And the guitarist was Nile Rogers. Oh. Right. In fact, I found a, I have a cassette of that band somewhere. <laughs> and um. So. When, while, while we were doing the Great Adventure gig, because the gig would end at around four or five in the afternoon, and then Niall would take off for the city for his after hours gigs. Yeah. And he had a friend that would come hang out at the park and pick him up, a guy named Bernard Edwards. <laughs> the, the, his partner and co-writer and producer and chic. And so Bernard would be hanging out at the park waiting for Niall and listen to us jam. So at the end of that summer, um, Niall and Bernard said to me, listen, dude, we are we are um, getting ready to go to Paris, me and Nard. Yeah. You should come with us, right? We're gonna start a new band, we're going to Paris, we got a gig at a hotel, whatever, and we can hold up in there and work on the music. <laughs> and I said to them, well, I just got, accepted into music in our high school. So I don't want to be a high school dropout before I even get there. So you guys go ahead, have fun, and I'll see you when you get back. Right. You know, when they made it back, they made it back on the charts as Chic. And I'm listening to Yowza, Yowza, Yowza. (laughs) I'm on the radio in school. I'm going, oh, shoot, man, maybe I should have gone to Paris. (laughs) Right, 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 right. <laughs> sure, man. But Nile and me, Nile and I, we stayed in touch. Yeah. And um, the next time I saw, one time I saw Nile, uh, I was I was walking on Fifty Seventh Street, going somewhere. He was going in the opposite direction, and I was like, man, you know, we hugged. I hadn't seen him in a while, and he was telling me how excited he was because their song "Le Freak" went platinum. It was like one of the biggest selling singles in the history of Atlantic Records. And he was really yeah. excited that he was getting ready to get his first royalty check and from that record. And he was just like, really, and I was happy for my friend because I'm like, dude, that's incredible. And we're, you yeah. know, you just, you know, when, when your friends are blowing up like that, 
in my mind, I always looked at that as, well, if it could happen for him, it could happen for me or anybody else. If my friends are doing it. You can do it too. I can do it too. You know, and actually the keyboard player in the band, a guy named um, Raymond Jones, also from the neighborhood, played yeah. was the keyboard player with Sheik as well. So Raymond and I were hanging out all the time. Now I'm telling you all this Nile stuff because Nile, when David Bowie contacted Nile to produce that record, it, Nile called me to play on it. Uh. That's so the whole, the reason I'm telling you the story to give you the background of me and Nile is because that was the connect. For some reason, I guess Tony might have been doing some other stuff and Nard started producing other people and I guess he needed to get this record done for David. So he wanted to put together a different rhythm section. So he he called myself and a bass player named Carmine Rojas. And Carmine, I actually met Carmine in the 70s as well. He was the bass player for LaBelle. Okay. <clears throat> Right. That's a whole other story. Um, but yeah, so we go in the studio, Power Station Studios in New York City, and we cut the Let's Dance album. Oh, wow. And all of those, you know, I think my country, I think I, I worked on the record for three or four days, you know, or just cutting the tracks. I did on Let's Dance, Modern Love, China Girl. There's another track called Ricochet. Yeah, maybe two or three days I was done with, with my part. Wow. That was like, I think, Bowie's probably biggest seller, too, Let's Dance. That may have been his biggest uh, selling uh, recording. Yeah, probably so. And it, and it, and it was huge. And, and oddly enough, it was one of those things that, that changed my life in a way. Yeah. You know, yeah. because, <clears throat> you know, the, the interesting thing about the, about the music business is that people are very quick to typecast musicians into a particular style. But for me, I grew up playing a lot of different styles and my involvement in the industry was everything from jazz to rock to funk to reggae, you know, whatever. I was right. I was basically a sponge as a kid. And and for me, it wasn't about saying no to a gig. You know, That's it's right. competitive. So if somebody called you for a gig, the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, a reg guy called me, a uh, Jamaican brother got my number from, and he called me, hey, mom, can you play reggae? Now, up until that point, I had never really played any reggae at all. Didn't have any experience playing reggae. I, Of course, I had heard Bob Marley Records and the other superstar uh, Jamaican artists, but I didn't really know how to play reggae myself. Right. But I was like, yes, I can play reggae. <laughs> and he said, okay, well, you're hired for next weekend. Oh. And I hung up the phone. And I was like, okay, I got a week to get it together. <laughs> right, right. Because the answer is yes. If I had said no, the next cat would have got the gig and I need the money. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, right. That's right, man. <laughs> the answer is yes. So what did I do? I went to the record store and I bought a whole bunch of reggae records. And... Uh, and immersed myself in reggae. And then I realized, well, that's not, it's sort of working. But I was like, I got to do something else. Then I heard about this club in the city. And the, pro the club is probably still there. Maybe it's SOBs. But I, I remember, okay, reggae night. I'm going to go to this club and just vibe the music and be, be in. So I get to the club. And I, I want to say that that was the night I learned how to play reggae music. The, because I, I, I got immersed in the, in the energy, yeah. with the people. Yeah. You know, the door opened and a big cloud of ganja came out. <laughs> <laughs> Felt like a hand reached, reached out of the smoke and pulled me into the club. Wow. And, you know, I got a, you know, somebody had to be a drink and I'm listening to the, the PA system pumping. And then I got, you know, I, I made a couple of friends with some of the kids there. And next thing I know, I'm on the dance floor and I'm dancing with them, with those Jamaican sisters and brothers out there. We having fun. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, this is awesome, man. <laughs> and then I realized, you know, being a drummer, it's not just about playing beats, but it's about 
feeling beats, about connecting to beats. It's like, yeah. you know what I mean? The language of drumming, uh, unlike a lot of other instruments, there's a physical component that you need to connect with with the music. There's a posture. Funk has a posture and a, and a thing. Jazz has a thing. Reggae has it. And you need to incorporate that into your physical thing in order to play a certain groove, a certain beat authentically. And so that's why I said that was the, I learned to play reggae that night, more so than listening to the records, but to be hanging with them and in the club and eating the food and yeah. the DJ and dancing. You, you, that's, a, that's a good point you make, Omar. You know, it's not just buying records and sitting listening, but when you sort of embraced it, when you went down there to see how people really are you know you actually had to experience it and be there to to really get a feel for this thing and that probably helped uh help open you up well now but and, and when you think about it that's how i learned pretty much how to play everything else because everything was community based so there was yeah. a jazz community in queens there was a funk community in queens we were doing it i was going to block parties my friend we were all learning the latest dances there was there was a whole culture around the jazz the bebop the funk the rock you got you to understand that to understand the music. Yeah, yeah, good point. You also played with Sting. Uh, was it uh, Dream of the Blue Turtles, one of his uh, great records from the late 80s? What was it like working with Sting, man? Uh, again, another dream come true gig because I was a huge police fan. Oh, yeah. yeah. I love the police. I love Stuart Copeland's drumming. Yeah. I love their songs. I bought all of those records. So it was really interesting that a few years later, you know, of, of being a fan yeah. that I would actually end up playing with him. And um, I got I got an interesting call. Uh, there was an engineer friend of mine named Neil Dorfsman. And um, he, Neil worked at the Power Station Studios. And uh, like I said, I was doing a lot of work there, different artists. And I love Neil's engineering. So when Weather Report was cutting the procession record, mm -hmm. they they wanted somebody to to cut to track us. And I I recommended Neil. Okay. So we've got to use Neil. Let's let's you know, we were basically recording procession sort of on the road. You know, we did some of it in Chicago, we did some of it at Power Station in New York. <clears throat> so Neil uh got the gig with a band called Dire Straits to record their oh, record. Oh yeah, Dire Straits, yeah. They they made a record, really big record, called Brothers in Arms. Um, they were recording in, in on the island of Montserrat. Yeah, at, that uh, uh, that you just made me think of something. Earth, Wind, and Fire recorded their album Faces, uh, that same place, yeah, Montserrat, the island. Of, yeah, I remember yeah, that. Incredible studio, uh, owned by the Beatles producer George Martin. Mm -hmm. George Martin. Was called, it was called Air Studios Montserrat. There's Air Studios London, but yeah. Air Studios Montserrat. So I get a call. You know, back then, the, the, you know, a long distance call sounded like a long distance call, right? <laughs> you know, you could <laughs> right, right, you know. right. And it's Neil, and Neil says, "Hey, man, I'm I'm down here in Montserrat. You know, uh, the the drummer got sick, and I was telling Mark Knopfler about you. Can you come?" and finished the record now i get this call coming in like two in the morning three in the morning so i was like yeah sure man you know I'll, I'll, i'm down so the next day i get on the phone with their manager and um we, we arranged a plane ticket and everything and i think i flew out the very next day you know and we cut brothers in arms i think the hit was called uh, money for nothing so the day we cut money for nothing sting was there vacationing on the island. He was on holiday with his wife. And he had, actually he, he sang on the song. Now that his voice is on the, in vamp of that song. Yeah. Singing, I want my MTV, right? So, but I was in the, I was in the booth, so he couldn't really see me. Um, but at dinner that night, I'm singing, sitting at one end of the table and Sting and Trudy and Mark Knopfler are, you know, sitting at the other end. And I'm, I hear, I overhear the conversation and Sting is telling them how he's leaving the police and he's in, he's been in New York auditioning cats for the band. 
for his new band. And my ears perked up. I was like, wow, that sounds really amazing. He said, yeah, and last week I, uh, I saw Branford Marcellus and Kenny Kirkland. And now I'm like, okay, so. <laughs> right, right. You know, now you're talking to Daryl, and I, I'm, I'm talking to Daryl Jones. I was like, okay, that's my boy now. So I was like, that's amazing. So I, I stopped eating and I yelled down the table, well, you found your drummer, right? <laughs> and, and Mark goes, oh, Sting, I'm sorry. I didn't introduce you guys. Sting, this is Omar and Omar, this is Sting. And they'll Sting looks and he goes, you're Omar Hakeem? And I go, yeah. He said, wow, that's, that's amazing because my manager is in New York looking for you right now. What? I'll tell oh him my, right here. That was meant to be, man. Wow, that's incredible. That's 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 an example of synchronicity for you <laughs> police fans. <laughs> that's incredible. Wow. Okay, so yeah, that's what I was like. Wow, that's pretty amazing. But when he said, when he started naming my friends, Daryl, you know, Daryl and, you know, Daryl was touring with Miles. I was touring with Weather Report. We see each other all the time, right? And of course... Ramford and Kenny, you know, at the time they were playing with Winton and that band with Jeff Watts, man, that was like. Oh yeah, Jeff Ting Watts, yeah. Ooh, yeah. That band was amazing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So when he started naming my, I felt like he was naming my crew. Yeah. You know, I was like, I gotta be down with that. That's just, that's just gonna be crazy. And uh, sure enough, get back to New York. And um the day we got together was the day that band came together. It was Ken Kenny Kirkland, Daryl Jones, Branford and myself, and Sting. Sting didn't play bass on that tour. He played guitar on that tour. Daryl Jones was the bass player. And you could tell from the from the moment we started playing together, it was a vibe. The chemistry was there on day one. And a week later, th then things started moving really, really fast after that. Uh, 1985 because we did like a, a week of rehearsals and then they did a, a surprise gig at a venue in New York where it got out there were lines around the corner we played all of that new music and it was a huge buzz because Sting was a superstar at that point oh yeah yeah and, <clears throat> and then we packed up a couple of weeks later we were in Barbados recording at um, Eddie Grant's studio it's on his farm. He had an incredible recording studio on his farm in Barbados. Um, and it seemed like, like I said, it was like an accelerated vibe. Then in the, like a month after we finished the record, we did this uh, movie, documentary movie called Bring on the Night. Yeah. You know, so it was like, man. So, you know, again, one of those life-changing moments, you know? Incredible, incredible. And also, man, you work with Miles Davis. Uh, blew my mind. I think you were on what Tutu and Siesta, if I'm not mistaken, and Amandala as well. Um, oh, Amandala. Oh, yeah, I love that. That's a great yeah, one. Amanda. Oh, wow. What was it like working with Miles, man? Well, that's again, you know, it's all about connections and relationships. That was Marcus Miller bringing his, his buddy in ah. to work on the record because uh, Miles really loved Marcus, yeah, really respected Marcus and gave Marcus a lot of free reign to make the Tutu album. Yeah. Uh, and and Marcus really did a lot of the drum programming. A lot, a lot of the, a lot of that sound was, you know, Marcus's genius drum programming. But Marcus wanted me to come in and, and, and embellish what was happening with the machines and stuff. So I would, I came in. I would bring like cymbals and, you know, maybe a snare, maybe something, and just play on top of the the electronic drums bed. Yeah, kind of add stuff to it, you know, and um, and you know I did a lot of that in the eighties because of the, the the advent of the drum machine. Yeah, you know, man. it was like I I had to figure out how I was going to work in the session scene, and so I I also had to become a programmer. You know what I mean to survive. You know, but one of the things that a lot of the cats did was you'd program drums and then you'd play acoustic elements over it. You know, and so that's a lot of what's going on on the Tutu record. Yeah. And then, but when we did a mandala, we cut, we tracked that, you know, he and I just playing the drum set and bass and, you know, you know. We, oh, you guys were rolling. 
man, that's a, that's a, especially that first cut on a mono, I think it's called Katembe or something like that. That mm-hmm. one is, is, uh, is hot, but man, I wanted to talk to you about something still to this day. Mm. When you guys did that show, Night Music or Sunday Night, I still have just about every episode, Amar, and I still remember the theme. Da, 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 oh, yeah. da, da. <laughs> Man, that show was awesome. And I'm yeah. like, they don't have anything like that anymore. I mean, you, Marcus, uh, David Sanborn, um, you guys were unbelievable. And everybody was on that show. I was trying to tell some people who never seen it. I said, those cats had us as Miles was on there, Dizzy Gillespie, Wayne Shorter, Carlos Santana, Javon. I said, they even had obscure groups like the Ambitious Lovers. I mean, you guys exactly. had every, that was an incredible show, man. And uh, I stayed up. Uh, to watch it. I think it would come on like at midnight and it ran for like a few years. And uh, it was just unbelievable, man. Every single artist was on that show. And it's it's a shame it didn't stay on. I ran into David Sanborn a number of years ago and I said, David, y'all got to bring that show back. He said, Preston, talk to NBC, you know, (laughs) but uh, tell me, man, what was it like working on that show, man? Because you were the drummer, you were the house drummer. And I said, Omar, and it was just incredible, man. What was that experience like? Well, that it's funny because that experience of that band, it was basically a touring band. Yeah. You know, we had already been out playing with David off and on for many years. I met, you know, again, giving you a little history, you have to rewind a little bit back to 1981 when I did that first tour with Gil Evans' big band in Europe. And I met David Sanborn on that tour. And... Uh, and then I ended up joining David's band after that. I made a record with him um, called As We Speak. As We Speak. Oh, yeah. And uh, that was myself and Marcus and David and a uh, keyboard player named Don Freeman and Michael Sambello on guitar. Yeah. So, so over the next eight years or so, in between doing other things, I would play gigs with David when I was, when I was free, you know? And in the in the late eighties, before we did night music, the band was Philippe Sace. That's right. Boards. It was Don Elias on percussion, Marcus, Hiram, and myself. And sometimes you guys used another bassist when Marcus wasn't there. Real, uh, I forgot the guy's name. He's real, real short. Oh, Tom played... Barney. Yeah, Tom Barney. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So you know, David floated this idea he had he and his manager had been talking about this show uh and they asked me did i want to participate and it was like perfect for me because i wasn't on tour with anybody at that time and it was like you know a, a in town gig right right you know? right and it was a really interesting production schedule because it each show took three days to you know we would do two shows a week the you know it would be a monday to saturday schedule so monday we rehearse with half the guests. Tuesday, uh, we would rehearse with the other half of the guests. Um, and then Wednesday was the shoot day. Yeah. And then, so we would do a, a run through and the, they'd shoot the run through, then they'd bring the audience in and then we'd do the show, right? And then Thursday, the schedule would start again. Thursday rehearsal, Friday rehearsals. Saturday uh, run throughs and shoot Sunday off and then start again. Right. Wow. So it was, it was a lot of work and it was a lot of fun. And it, and it was a great gig for me because I got a chance to explore, you know, Omar, you, Omar, you played with everybody. I mean, everybody who was somebody was on that show. I'm just sitting here thinking of names that pop up, you know, uh, James Taylor, the Pat Matheny group, uh, like I said, Javon, Jeff Healy, I can go on and on. Everybody was on that show. And who was the drummer? It was Omar Hakim. You were you were there. I do remember one specific show, and you'll remember this. I remember a fan or somebody wrote in and was complaining, like, oh, these cats are not real musicians. They can't play. And then you guys, all of y'all went electric, and y'all had, like, these uh, instruments, electronic drums. <laughs> and y'all were like, can't get enough of that funky <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I remember that, man. I That's remember I sat there and watched that. You, Hiram Bullock, all of y'all, whoa, 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 whoa. Y'all, y'all were jamming. I, and I just remember you bopping to the side. Y'all were like, you know. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty funny, man, with the toy with the toy instruments. Right, right. right. <laughs> I still have that thing somewhere. <laughs> oh, my gosh, man. It was great. It was beautiful. And I was so sad when it ended. I remember 
I guess years later, Jules Holland tried to start something and he tried to do the same thing, but it was never the same. Just that chemistry that you guys had and the music was just so tight. And I'm like, wow, uh, it's a shame that show's just not on today. I still watch yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a it was a beautiful experience, man. And um, you know, it's I I wish that they would actually release a lot of those things. I heard the reason they didn't do it was because the licensing for all of the music was a little bit of a nightmare to kind of organize it all. Do you know most of the episodes are actually on YouTube? I actually I've seen them now. Yeah. I, I've seen a few of them. A few of them pop up on my feed. And it, and it's fun for me to take a little trip down memory lane. And the, the last one I saw, in fact, somebody sent it to me, uh, was the episode with Bootsy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah I know I, that one. Yeah, somebody yeah. sent that to me. He said, "Dude, you you were funking out on this," and and it was so much fun, man. Because like you said, you know, one 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 day I'd be playing with Bootsy, the next day I'd be playing with with Stevie Ray Vaughan, and then another, yeah. another day Dizzy would Dizzy Gillespie would come in. So it was really great for me as a musician, as a drummer who loves to play different genres of music because I got a chance to sort of flex that with every show, you know? Yeah, and that's what that's what's so unique. I can't think of any other drummer. I mean, when you think about it, every drummer would want that chair, but I'm like, Omar Hakim has played with everybody. And uh, yeah, like I said, I still watch that show. Also wanted to talk to you about Madonna, man. You work with her for like eight years, man. How'd you hook up with her? Is it that same type of story again? You can well, tell me. <laughs> yeah, Madonna. Um, okay, I got it. Okay, okay, you know, again, connections are really interesting. So I right. mentioned earlier the keyboard player who was my friend for Chic, a guy named uh, Raymond Jones. And Raymond uh, knew Madonna and knew uh, uh, Cats in her band, right? I'm talking like when she first started. Right, right. And so Raymond said to me in like 83, 84, there's this girl in New York City, she's putting a band together and she's looking for an MD. And I mentioned your name, why don't you do it? Mm -hmm. Her name is Madonna. And I had heard um, her early record that, right. that Reggie Lucas produced. So I, I, I was familiar, of course, because it was a huge hit, but I was on the road weather report. So I couldn't really take that MD thing, you know, and I, I was really busy. But, and then right after that, Niall connected with her and yeah. they made her breakout record, like her real serious breakout. So isn't it interesting that it's the same crew of people that she yeah. comes from Detroit right. and connects with Niall Rogers, Paul Pesco, Raymond Jones, Tony Thompson, Bernard Edwards, the New York crew, yeah. right? And even the DJ scene, you know, Chef Pettibone, you know, uh, there, there, there was a whole crew that she connected with and, and it was still about musicians, you know, yeah. records weren't all programmed yet at this moment. So it was still about the cats who could really go in the studio and, and jam, yeah, go in and make a record. Right, right. And and Cheek and Nile Rogers and Bernard, they were a hit record making machine. Right. So anyway, fast forward a few years. Um, Madonna is being managed by a guy named Freddie DeMann, who managed probably the three biggest artists on the planet at that moment. Michael Jackson, Madonna and Lionel Richie. Yeah. So Lionel had called me uh, to play some gigs with him and work on an album that he was doing in 1990. So I, I think I started working with, with, with Lionel in 89. Okay. This was, it was sort of like night music was winding down and I was going back and forth to LA doing stuff with Lionel. And, um, and Freddie really dug me and he saw what I did with, um, with Lionel. And in 1991, I guess, or 92, um, I get a call. Freddie says, listen, man, Madonna has to do uh, Saturday Night Live. But we don't want to fly a band from L.A. to New York. So can you put a band together for us for, for Madonna? And I was like, sure. It's interesting, too, because, again, it's funny how it came back around. Right. You're right put a band together for Madonna. So I put a band together for Madonna. So I got Victor Bailey to play ah. bass, who is not only an incredible jazz bass player, but that's one of the funkiest mugs 
Yes, he is. Yeah. You were on his debut album too. Yeah. I mean, Victor <laughs> Bailey was like a, a ridiculous musician. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I was like, all right, well, if I'm going to, I need a cat who can play bass, guitar, and keyboard bass. I said, like, got to be Victor Bailey. Yeah. Right? So I got Victor. And then I got this bad keyboard player from Chicago named Michael Bearden. Oh, yeah. Right? So I was like, all right, because Mikey B can play anything. Yeah. Right? So I got Michael. And um, that was sort of like the nucleus for, for the band. And uh, I'm not remembering who else, because it was a while ago. But Madonna. Oh, I got Bashiri to play percussion. Bashiri Johnson. Yeah. Uh, was Paul Pesco in that? Anyway, it was it was a killing gig. Madonna loved it, right? And so she says to me after the after the gig, "Oh, you got I love you guys. I'm gonna take you on tour." So you know I'm, you know when I hear an artist say that, I was like, all right, well they're excited and, you know they'll get over in about a uh, in about a week and then right, I won't hear right. from you know and it's and it's all good, you know it was fun and we had great it was a great gig, but she was serious. And a couple of weeks later, Freddie DeMann called me and said, listen, Madonna wants to take you guys on tour. So I was like, oh, okay, Let, let's do this, you know? So after a couple of months of prepping and making the deal and getting it happening, me, uh, Michael Bearden and Victor Bailey and Paul Pesco um, flew out west to join the West Coast part of the band, which was Jay Winding on keyboards, who was her MD. And yeah. Uh, the amazing Luis Conte on percussion, you know. So it was, it was, it was amazing, man. And and I thought that I was just going to um, do that one tour, and you know that'd be it. You know, fun tour. You know, make some nice money and get out of there. It's all good. But it ended up being eight years that I spent. Yeah, man, that's incredible. That's you know incredible. what I mean? And 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 and, and she was. Uh, I, I don't think I've worked with any artist for that long when I think about it. Yeah. Except, well, I was with David for a, a long time. Yeah. You know, from 81, you know, the, up until the show. Yeah. You know, but in pop music, you know, Madonna uh, was the one that I spent the most time with in the, on sort of the pop side of things. And she was, first of all, she's a genius and she is, um, one of the hardest working people I've ever witnessed. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, like you would see her on TV and she'd be doing her PR thing and she'd, you know, she, she, she's very connected to the understanding of what it takes to be a star. Right. You know, some people aren't just stars, they're icons. Exactly, exactly. You know, there, there's, she's a professional icon, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's how I looked at her. Cause she yeah. was really badass, man. And she, understood presentation and she understood the type of organization and, and work ethic that it took to make those shows come alive her and her brother uh chris they put together some pretty awesome stuff and to 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 observe her work ethic was really mind-blowing and was really educational and eye-opening because i was like you know what people like Madonna, Michael Jackson, right. Prince, you know, fast forward to now Lady Gaga. Yeah. You know, anybody who's a superstar who puts on these kind of shows like this, it's it's a discipline oh, yeah. that is beyond just being a musician. You know? Absolutely right, man. I wanted to go back a little bit, something that we uh, sort of skipped over, but I thought about it. I was, uh, I remember distinctly I uh, was buying some music at the time. This is back in 1989, and it was a GRP sampler. And I heard a brother on here singing, it's crucial to groove. <laughs> like, who is this? Who is this? Omar Hakim. <laughs> man, I love that song. I'm not joking. I still play it to this day, man. I actually still have that cassette of the GRP sampler. And really? I'm like, uh, yeah. And I says, Omar can sing. Because I never really heard you sing before and when I first heard the cut. I'm going through these songs and, you know, I hear some stuff with, uh, you know, Eric Marienthal, the sax yes. player, and some other people. But I hear this guy singing Crucial to Groove. I said, this is Omar Hakim? I said, maybe they made a mistake. 
<laughs> the, brother, the brother sings too. So, but man, I loved it. It was great, man. And uh, talk about being uh, multi talented. I mean, just your drumming as a vocalist, you know, as a producer, man, you do it all. And I was really impressed. That was right around the time that night music was still doing its thing. I think it was Sunday night first and then night music. But that's right. I just, I just remember, I'm like, wow, this cat is uh, very interesting. I was really impressed because I had never, I didn't know that you sang. So oh. it was, uh, it was, it was smooth, man. Crucial to groove, yeah. Yeah, fun stuff, man. And you're right; it was right at the at the time that night music was happening. And I was, yeah. uh, you know, when we were off, I was uh, writing and and working on my first solo album, which was called Rhythm Deep. Yeah. And so there Remember. was a couple of singles, Crucial to Groove. There was another ballad on the record called uh, Take My Heart. Take my heart, yeah. That got a lot of. You got a great voice, man. You should be singing more. I'm serious. It's funny, man. I I just started. I reconnected with my writing partner, uh, James Golden. Yeah. And uh, and in fact, um, he wrote some lyrics to a song that I wrote for the band Urban Nights called Hearts of Longing. Urban Nights. Now, did you work with uh, Maurice White on that? Was it Urban yes, Nights I did. too? Yeah, yeah, Maurice. Yeah. yeah. So Jane, when James James said, "Dude, I have some lyrics for that song," and I was like, "All right, well, send them to me." And you know, James James and I, you know, he wrote "Crucial to Groove with Me," "Take My Heart." So it was kind of nice to reconnect and start thinking about writing songs with him again. But uh, I I just laid a vocal on it last night. Oh wow! And so I'm thinking I'm sort of getting in the mood to make another record. Please do, man. You Please know, do. You know, it's funny. I I mean. Solo records for me are more of more me chronicling where I'm at at that moment. Right. You know what I mean? So, and, and as a result, I don't, I, I probably don't make them as regularly as I, as I should. Right. You know, I'll, I, it seems like I put one out every five or 10 years, but I'm sort of getting in the mood now. Yeah. I'm starting to put together some tracks for things. And I and uh, you're not the only one that said I should start singing again. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, kind of get get it back together again. And that would be fantastic, man. Because like I said, you know, and I remember after listening to it, I says, man, I would like to hear more from this guy because I know of the, the incredible drummer that you are. But I'm like, wow, you know, great vocalist. You know, the, the talent is definitely there. I wanted to talk to you about another uh, iconic band uh, that you hooked up with uh, not long ago, maybe three, four, five years back, A Journey. How did you get how did you get that gig, man? That was fantastic. You know, tell yeah. us about that. Well, I've been friends with the leader of the band, Neil Sean, for a long time. Yeah. And, 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 and again, there's a there's a rich backstory there as well. Uh, in the 80s, when I got off the road with Sting, um, I got a call from San Francisco saying that Journey was auditioning drummers. Yeah. Would I like to come out and audition for the band? So I was like, oh, interesting. What happened to Steve Smith? You know, because I was, again, a huge Journey fan, right? Right. And even Victor Bailey said that's, he remembers me being on the Weather Report tour bus listening to uh, Journey records sometimes. Like I, yeah. I had this crazy playlist that I would bring on the bus, you know. Right, with, right. You know, I would I would have like a steel a Steely Dan record, you know, Steely and Dan, <laughs> a Journey record. Then I I'd, I'd have a Marvin Gaye record, and you know maybe something by Mother's Finest, and then and so I would be playing the stuff on the bus, you know. And Joe would listen to it with me. Some of it he was digging, some of it he wasn't. <laughs> but one of the records was a Journey record, and uh, so I thought it was interesting that at the end of the uh, tour with Sting that I got this call. So I flew out. I was like, yeah, I love Journey. I'm gonna fly out there. I know the songs, you know, from my cover band days, you know, I could memorize and kind of mimic things, you know? And so when they when they started counting off the songs, I think they were surprised that I could just play them. Yeah. You know, Don't Stop Believing. And, you know, oh, I could just God. play those beats, right? And, they, and I, I remember <laughs> Steve Perry sort of turning around, looking at me like, <laughs> <laughs> How do you know? How do you know these? And I was like, Yeah, I'm a fan. I know your music, man. I, you know, know. I know the music. And so they hired me basically on the spot, but the whole deal fell apart. Uh, um, there, there was a, you know, without getting into the bloody gories of right, of, of, of the you know the gory details, you know, it wasn't meant to happen at that moment. But Neil and I became friends, right? And I ended up helping Neil out on a solo record and we stayed in touch and, 
you know, so fast forward to 1990, no, I'm sorry, 2005. Uh, Neil calls me and he says, dude, I'm, I'm coming to New York. You know, I always get these, I'm coming to New York, I need a band, <laughs> right? So he said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to play at the Hard Rock Cafe. We're going to do a tribute gig for Les Paul. Mm. Can you put a band together? So I was like, sure. So I, I got um, Jerry Brooks, who's the bass player on my last couple of records. Yeah. Uh, my wife, Rachel Z on keyboards. Mm. Um, Nick Morak to play rhythm guitar who used to play with Lenny White's 29 band and play with so many people. And so we put a dope rock and roll, hard hitting rhythm section together for him to play his solo music. Right. Right. And so he comes to New York, we rehearse and it's, it was sounding good, man. You know, Nick Morak was holding down the, the rhythm guitar stuff and Neil was just always playing his buns off. Very great. And, but, but while we're talking, while we're rehearsing, Neil is sort of telling, me about troubles in paradise with journey you know and i'm like wow man that's really sorry to hear that you know he was telling me what was going on and and on you know one one night on the drive home my wife says to me omar you know he's going to call you for that right and i was like there's no way that anybody who is in journey is leaving journey right you know like it just doesn't make any sense right and the guy that they have there now has been there for 20 years and so you know, I'm sure they're going to work it out. You know, ro these bands are like families. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They're together for so long. Right. You know, and what do families do? They they bicker. They, you know, they have their moments and then everybody kisses and makes up. And right, right. It's all good. So I'm like, you know, it's all good. Uh, two weeks later. <laughs> Rachel was right. <laughs> Rachel was right. And I was at the gym. My phone was off that morning because actually my band was rehearsing to play a gig, like a CD release party for my my record that came out in in um what what record what record was that? We had a gig. Oh, for the We Are One record. Okay. Right. So we were rehearsing to play a gig. But um Neil called and said, Hey man. You got to do this. And like I said, I was at the gym that morning and they were like, did you get the call? Because they knew I was playing. My trainer knew I was playing with, with Neil a couple right. of weeks before that. He said, did you hear? Did you get the call? I said, did I hear what? About the drummer and journey. Did they call you? And I was like, no, my phone's off. And I turned my phone on and there were like 10 messages from Neil. Right. Right. And so I ended up flying out that night to go play a gig with journey at the Greek theater. So what is this? 2014. Yeah, 2014. Wow, man, time is flying. I know. I know. It's amazing. I'm 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 spacing out on the time, but yeah, that was 2014, maybe even 20. No, it was 2015. 15, okay. 2015. Okay. Right? So it was a fun tour, man. You know, um, again, dream come true gig, because I've always enjoyed Neil's plan. I've I've been a Neil Sean fan. Forever, I just love the way he plays. Yeah, and you know he 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 delivered every night, and the songs are are amazing. Yeah, man, you know, and and the crowds. I mean, it, it's you know that that whole rock and roll vibe. Oh yeah, it's so it's so fun, you know, to be on those tours and to to have the rush of the big audiences and the mm -hmm. you know it's it's really really a lot of fun. So I spent I spent about three or four months with, with those guys touring. We toured Canada. We did some American dates, some private dates. But eventually what happened is they did a, a reunion of their original rhythm section, which was to bring Steve Smith back, which I was happy about because I was, like I said, a Journey fan. And yeah. Steve was playing on all the hits. So I was looking forward to seeing him back with the band again. And But they, but they unfortunately, um, Steve Perry wasn't able to return, which would have right. been really... I know. Amazing. Too. They ended up getting another guy that sounds a lot like him, you know. So yeah. Oh, that Arnell Pineda is is a bad dude, man. Yeah. And he's he's a, he's a nice guy too. Spent a lot of time with them and talking with him. Yeah. He's just a really sweet person, a lot of energy, and he was singing his buns off every night, man. Wow. That's not easy music to sing. No, no. It's 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 really something else. I mean, like I said, I'm just thinking about Steve Perry and 
how big Journey was, you know, back in the day. And that okay. voice of his, he had a great voice. You know, he, that, that band was known for their their vocals. Um, oh, yeah. But I wanted to also talk to you, man. You're also an educator. Now, did you become like the chair uh, at uh, Berkeley College of Music? Tell us about that. That was just, what, a few years ago, like three or four years ago? It was, man. Yeah. Um, you know, out of the blue, I got, uh, I got an offer. Um, to consider the position of chair of percussion department at Berkeley. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. Um, and I was like, I know a lot of the cats there. Yeah. And it could be really fun to like be around a lot of my friends that actually are professors there. That's right. You know what I mean? And a lot of people that I really love and respect as artists and musicians work there. Yeah. I was like, and then the way it was presented to me, I was thinking, okay, well, maybe I can continue because I'm still busy in the music business. Mm -hmm. But I, I wanted to make a contribution to the school. It's a school that I love and, and, and respect. Mm. Um, the, the, the percussion program is just incredible. Yeah. And when you think about the cats that work there, you know, uh, Yaron Israel, yeah. Tony Thunder Smith, Ralph Peterson, you know, it's, it's a long... It's a long list of cats, man. Enrique D. Almeida, who's an incredible educator and writer. Um, Kenwood Denard. Oh, yeah. Uh, incredible drummer who played with Jaco Pistorius and so right. others. So when I thought about the opportunity to support the department, because that's how I looked at it. You know, these cats, they already, that, that, is a, that is a machine that is already up and running and doing what it does right. and doing what it does well. Exactly. So... For me, it was more, how can I go in, enhance, and support, you know? Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, um, my schedule was still, you know, as, as, a, as, you know, being out in the world, still busy, you know, I re and the guy who hired me passed away a couple of weeks after he hired me, unfortunately. Um, there was talk about, uh, Rachel also becoming uh, or or being offered and having an opportunity to go for chair of the piano department. Yeah. Uh, and we thought, okay, well, if we're able to do that, then that might even justify us moving to Boston for a moment. Mm -hmm. because, you know, I was excited about it. Uh, but then after really being there for about a, about 18 months, almost two years, I was like, you know, as much as I love it and as much as I love and respect everything that's happening up here, I really can't change. I really can't do this at this moment. And it broke my heart a little bit because I really did want to do it. And I, I love being there with the kids. And I used to walk to the various classes and workshops and just marvel at, you know, what the, the professors were just sharing with these kids, man you know and and how the kid it was inspiring to to see these young incredible musicians yeah you know just soaking up all of this information and it, it was really a wonderful wonderful moment for me and uh you know hopefully i'll get a chance to go back and visit and hang with them you know, you know omar let me ask you do you uh teach any courses online you know, of course during this COVID, uh, a lot of musicians are, are, are teaching online i had mike stern on and he was just telling me some of the stuff that he's doing and i uh, had billy cobham on too and he said that he's in, involved in some type of project where he's getting a lot of drummers together like dennis chambers and others i think steve gad to do uh a work on some things but have you been teaching any courses online or is that something you're interested in doing i'm interested in doing it but i didn't do it this summer okay um, this summer was more of a you know it was an unexpected um break in, in our activity oh yeah oh yeah and and sometimes you realize uh with an unexpected break like this that um you know maybe i need to chill for a moment <laughs> you know? i got you and, and i and i i wasn't in the mindset where uh you know i, I was like I wanted to go deeper. I realized that after about 10 or 15 years of, of running with no break. Yeah. That I actually needed to stop, take care of my health. Um, my And actually I was home uh, to, to really deal with my elderly mother who was 
Yeah. Uh, and typically I'm on tour and I'm not able How to- How was your mother her. doing, if I may ask? How's she doing? She's she's doing okay now. She's Good. She just turned 91. Oh, that's a blessing, man. Wow. Yeah. And, and so this summer was a, was a little bit of a rough patch. Yeah. So yeah. I was in many ways, as much as it was a bummer that touring got canceled and Rachel and I had just put out a project uh, called Osmosis with Kurt Rosenwinkel and Lindley Marth. That's so a name we, I haven't heard in a while. Kurt. Wow. Yeah. yeah so we were we had already started touring last year and we were getting ready to do even more touring this year, but it all fell apart because of COVID. So I was like, you know what? A brother needs a rest. <laughs> but it, I hear like you, I said, it wasn't, wasn't really a rest because it gave me an opportunity to to spend time with my mom and, uh, you know, look after her and kind of, like I said, take care of my own health. And sometimes you don't realize how exhausted you are until you stop. Yeah, man. Yeah, exactly. Because you've been at it for a long time. I was going to ask you, Omar, when you're home, you know, you and Rachel just home chilling, relaxing, maybe a glass of wine or taking it easy and you're listening to music. What artists are you checking out? Are you listening to like some classic jazz stuff like, you know, Thelonious Monk, (laughs) Bud Powell or some weather report or who are you checking out right now, man? Well, you know, it's funny because we are we listen to a little bit of everything depending on the mood. You know? Yeah. And um yeah, it's 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 a weird you know, any it's a weird playlist, I would say. Okay. You know, because I'm I'm listening to everything from old school R and B to rock stuff to even dance music. Yeah. You know. Uh sometimes I hear something on the TV show and I'll I'll pull out my phone and Shazam and I'm like, okay, what is that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Shazam is like an incredible invention because you know i could be anywhere and and hear something and i'm like okay shazam that you know what is that exactly yeah. so you know i'm I'm listening to all kinds of stuff. i don't know let me look at my yeah i'm curious man so what is omar king listening to just curious i'm always asking musicians that and sometimes what they tell me i'm not expecting you know yeah. I, had greg, I had greg osby on and he says preston sometimes it's the grateful dead sometimes it's miles davis james brown you know just I'm curious what musicians are listening to, you know? Yeah, well, let me, let me look at my list because these are these are some of the things that pop up. Okay. There's a band called Tame Impala. I really like them. They're, they're, they're really interesting. Uh, Tame I also, Impala, okay. Yeah, I also like the band Knower. Okay. Um, they're, they're pretty happening. And then... Um, what else popped up on my list recently? Um, Brandy's new record is nice. Also, Dua Lipa's Future Nostalgia is a is sort of my guilty pleasure record. Okay, <laughs> summer. okay, that's I really, cool. I, I really like that record. That that feels good. Nice. I'm. I see here. Uh, Patrice Russian came up on my list. Oh yeah. I have a a, a playlist of like all my favorite. Patrice Russian joints. Yeah, I, I had her on the show too, along with Chick Korea as well. Yeah, Patrice is great. Yeah. Yeah. Anderson Pack, that dude. Uh, real creative. Um, yeah, like I said, it's a weird list. Uh, Foo Fighters. Oh, yeah, man. Actually, I just made a record with them. Um, really? I'm not playing drums, though. I'm playing percussion. I met. Okay. I fell in love with. I've always loved Dave Grohl and I've always loved the Foo Fighters. And when they put out their record called uh, Wasting Light in 2011, that record bugged me. I was like, that is an awesome record, right? So, and they were playing a gig at Madison Square Garden and I didn't really know anybody, but I called Zildjian, my, my Zildjian Symbols rep, because I know that both Dave and, and Taylor Hawkins are Zildjian artists. And so he connected, he connected me with the Foo Fighters and then Taylor hit me back right away and said, You're, I got you tickets looking forward to hanging. So I go to Madison Square Garden and I ended up hanging with them that week because they played the garden for a few days. Then they played uh, in New Jersey in New York right. at uh, one of the arenas there. And and I hit it off basically with them. And so we've stayed in touch over the years. And so they, um, right before co- the COVID thing happened, um, I went in the studio with them to to play percussion on some tracks that they were doing with the producer Greg Kirsten. Gotcha. And uh, it's a real, it's really cool. In fact, the the single just came out. I saw that the 
they just released the single. It's called Shame. Shame. And there's a lot of crazy percussion stuff on there. Oh, I dig that, man. Uh, so that's that's me. And, yeah. Uh, but I, that's another band that I, I really love. Cool. Um, it's another band. Yeah, I like this, man. A lot of these, some of these artists I've never heard. I'm just interested to get into the mind of, of, of artists to find it. You know, what, what are they listening to? It just reminds me of the story with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah. Uh, one guy was asking, he said, you guys are listening to a lot of rock music on the bus. He says, no, heck no, man. He said, we're listening to Hank Mobley and Miles Davis. This is Isn't really, that something? you know, you would never think that, you know, what people are listening to. That's right, man. You know, yeah, there's another band. I'm just, a, I'm just spacing out a little bit. Um, okay, I guess it will. Anyway, it might come back to me. I was also going to ask you, Omar, what uh, drummers have you been most influenced by? Or maybe, huh? maybe, maybe five guys that really, really, you know, you look at them and says, you know, these five have really shaped maybe the way that I, I, I play um oh shoot that have been most influential for you i mean there's so many drummers because i've had a lot of them on the show as i said like you know sunny emery a lot of them but a couple of them talked about you too as i said i had uh, wow. uh, the, uh antonio sanchez on a few days ago and of course oh. lenny's been on billy cobham steve gad w dave weckle but uh but tell me you know who, who are your guys man just out of curiosity well, the first drummer i remember hearing in my life was art blakey <sighs> As a, as just a baby, because that's what my parents were playing. They and the yeah. records I remember were Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, and John Coltrane. Oh yeah, you know, my favorite things, and hearing Elvin Jones, and Art. Yeah. And then as time went on, you know, then of course Buddy Rich. Oh, was, incredible! Was a big band record that my dad used to love to play by Buddy, uh, Max Roach, Philly Joe Jones. You know, so when I think about the jazz world, you know, those those are the, those are the early, my early influences. <laughs> but then, um, when the in the fusion thing, Billy Cobham just messed my head up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Billy Billy Cobham messed my head up as a you know the first time I heard the Mavish Orchestra, one of my one of my childhood friends turned me on to Inner Mounting Flame. Oh, wow. That's their first, that one is powerful. That and Birds of Fire. Yeah, that Inner Mounting Flame is powerful. I love that one. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and it's funny because when I heard it, I didn't quite know what to do with that mentally. <laughs> I was 11 years old right. <laughs> and I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> you know what I mean? You gotta, <laughs> you gotta put some temptations on to bring me back. <laughs> bring me back yeah. to earth <laughs> put on the jackson five for a moment <laughs> to bring me back to earth okay now let's go back and hear that record again you know right, right. I mean, I'm, being, exactly. I'm being silly right now but that you know it was like somebody that grew up like i said listening to listening to bebop and listening to r&b right and somebody to, to put on the mahavishnu orchestra with like you know getting shot in a rock in a rocket to jupiter or something you yeah know? what just happened you exactly. know what i mean and Six months later, and it's funny how a young ear changes and evolves. That was the most beautiful thing I had ever heard. You know what I mean? And to hear Billy Cobham play those odd time signatures like that with so much power. Yeah. And yeah. so much, he changed the way cats were approaching the drum set at that moment. Yeah. Nobody played like that actually. Well, what what do you think of Tony Williams cuz his name constantly keeps coming up all the time. Tony was just like another one who's really ridiculous and and his I that that is like one of the most unique voices. Yeah. On the drums. One of the most unique voices. You know? Um Lenny White, another influence. When yes. I when I think about the fusion movement. Yeah. You yeah. know? Um Really, really incredible. But then I was influenced by by other cats. Like when I think about R and B and I think about like Clyde Stubblefield and Oh yeah. You know, Jabo, uh, I don't know, but Bernard Purdy. Uh a lot of cats in R and B don't talk about um I think his name was Roger Hawkins. Roger Hawkins from um Muscle Shoals rhythm section. 
he played on a lot of the Aretha Franklin records. I mean, there's a, mm-hmm. there's a few Aretha Franklin records that Bernard's playing on. Right. There's a few records that Roger Hawkins are playing on. He's an, another cat that like was on the radio a lot. Right. Uh, right. Was like, what about was what about problem? on the rock side, like Neil Peart, John Bonham, and those guys? Well, I liked. Um, I loved Hendrix. Oh wow! Yeah. So I loved Rich Mitchell's swing. Yeah, yeah, I got gotcha. you. You know what I mean? Um, but it's funny. It's like when I think about, I think I was more influenced by the jazz guys, even though I love rock music. I got gotcha. you. Got your found, you got your foundation from jazz. I got my my found my language foundation from jazz, even though I was listening to a lot of rock. Of course, you, when you're growing up in America, you can't help but hear uh, John Bonham, and you're gonna you're hearing, and of course on the radio, the Beatles, Ringo mm-hmm. Starr. You know, we're hearing um, Grand Funk Railroad. Don Brewer was a drummer in that band. Um, you know, there were there were these incredible. Musicians, you know, uh, Greg Arico, Sly and the Family Stone yeah. is another one that I, you know, I loved his playing. Um, so, yeah, I have a, I have a really interesting. It's know. a very eclectic mix, man. Yeah, that, I mean, that's good. I mean, your ears are open. And uh, that's one of the things I appreciate. And I was going to add to that list, Omar Hakim. You're there, man. Like I said, you uh one of the greatest drummers that I've ever heard. You played in various styles. That's why so many people call you, man, for gigs. They're like, Omar Hakeem, you know? But listen, man, I want to thank you so much for being on Jazz Talk. Love you. Uh, it's just a pleasure to have you on your class act. Hang on, I'm about to close out the show. Okay, well, you've heard it from Omar Hakeem. And as the saying goes, if the music grooves and makes you move, it must be jazz. I'm Preston Williams with Jazz Talk signing off. Peace. <laughs>